Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm your host, Kat Herter for the day, Brian Alexander, and welcome to an unusual Future Trends Forum, because this time we're doing it live from the New Media Consortium's annual conference in Rochester, New York. So if everyone in the room could just say hello. Hey! So we have hundreds of people here in the, in the city of Eastman Kodak, the city of Corning Glass, and we've been working for three days now. Yeah, it feels like longer. It does. But the idea is flowing. It does. And we've been talking about all kinds of topics. So what we're going to do for the next hour is I'm going to be talking with different people, different stars of the show, and we're going to be covering all kinds of things that have come up, getting people's impressions and thoughts. So we'd like to ask you as we go to please contribute as you can. So if you're on site using your machine, if you're off site using another machine, there are, as always, four major ways for you to contribute. So one way is, if you're a Twitter hound, please tweet at us using the hashtag FTTE. Second, if you're in the Shindig environment, there are a couple of different ways you can respond. At the very bottom right of the screen, there are the two orange dots. One has a raised hand that says raise. Click that, and that'll tell us that you want to come up on stage and talk to us. So as long as your mic and video recorder are working, we'd be glad to see you that way. If you're shy, if your camera isn't working, if if all of that happens and you're other text, there are two different ways for doing that. The bottom of the screen, there's a little button that says ask, type into that and you'll be able to send us a message which we can then read out loud. Or if you prefer to chat with people, take your cursor, mouse over your own icon, there'd be a little button that says I am chat, click that and you can text chat to everybody in your Shindig group. So all kinds of ways for you to participate. Please send us your thoughts, reflections, questions, pushbacks, howls of outrage, and just inspired ideas. Now, to begin with, uh, with me is the NMC. What is your current title? I think of oh, you as Hefe and Glorious Leader, but there's got to be something more precise than that. I'm going to change my business card to that immediately. I'll but for now, it's Senior Director of Publications and Communications, otherwise known as the Director of the Horizon Project. That is Samantha Adams, who is here with us, who has been doing an unbelievable amount of work here for the conference. So if I can just ask you, tell us what are some of the major concepts, what are some of the big themes that have surfaced as you've been going from session to session, talking to people and people? Well, there's definitely an overarching theme, first and foremost, and that's the people that we find at the summer conference um, always, but it's even more true this year, is no matter where they're coming from, libraries, higher ed, museums, K-12, they're always innovative and they're always open. These are the people that are constantly pushing the envelope and pushing the boundaries. So we've been seeing a lot of sessions really focused on the future. Um, I know there was an Internet of Things live session that garnered a lot of excitement where mm. the, where the mm. participants were actually part of the Internet of Things. Lots of talk of maker spaces, especially as you know, the, the, the community um, of education leaders is really focused on the shift from students as consumers to students as creators. Mm. So, mm -hmm. That's yeah. a huge thing. Hopefully we'll be talking about that in a few minutes. Um, and how is the atmosphere? You described it as energetic, excited, um, people who are just you know, getting used to the frigid cold of the north? Or? Yeah, you know, um, the weather has actually been beautiful, luckily, the past couple of days. NMC has really brought the sunshine. Um, as and I, I think the energy could be best described as invigorating. Um, I feel recharged. Like, I'm going to go back as an NMC staff member, and there's so many ideas I want to implement and so many new resources I want to be able to mm. dream up for the community. Nice. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, so good to hear that. Uh, I was really struck by the opening keynote from Cosmo Steincooler about gaming. And just as, as my tour through the conference from sessions of people, I was really impressed at how much interest there was in gaming and play. Uh, we're going to be talking about that in a little while, but. Is that now an emergent major topic for NMC, do you think? I think it, I think it should be. Um, I think mm -hmm. that we've been mm -hmm. talking about games and gamification for a while now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and in some ways, it's been a little bit stuck, not because it's not important or doesn't have huge potential. I think it's going to take the work of really innovative educators and influencers to mm -hmm. really make it widespread. And I loved the kernel from Constance about inviting children to participate yeah. in deciding the game topic. It's yeah. all about that learners as creators. If you didn't see the talk, it's a great talk. Is that available on the NMC site? It will be on the YouTube Very channel. Good. Oh, yeah. NMC.org. Uh, a couple of great points that she brought up. Constance did a lot of wonderful work on literacy with teenage boys, trying to see how they were reading at a high level in game-related stuff, but not reading very well at school. 
And one of the key takeaways was that the students felt an investment in what they were reading for games. They felt they had purpose and meaning, which they didn't feel with their schoolwork. So, I mean, having kids be involved, I think, is, uh, is vital and really changes the game. I would definitely agree with you. Well, speaking of gaming, uh, you're the director of the Horizon Report. I need another title. I think like <laughs> Grand Cronon or or, or the the Delphi, you know, the, um, you know, the, the wonderful you know, Hagia Sophia of, <laughs> of, of, of Horizon, because this is such a powerful project. What's the current status of Horizon going forward? You guys just had a big community meeting about Horizon, right? We did. Uh, I'm really excited about it because we're in our 15th year, um, which is no. yeah, 15 no, years. No, no, no. As far as I know, that's the longest uh, standing, you know, uh, research into emerging technology uptake. So it's really oh, exciting. But we're now at a point where we've done a lot of work and we've produced, I think, over 60 editions at this point. And it's time to breathe new life into it. Um, hmm. So I think, you know, in the coming, you know, months and years, you're still going to see the same things you love about the Horizon Report, which is the timely analysis of um, emerging trends and technologies. Mm -hmm. But today, mm -hmm. we invited the community and, and conference goers to actually help us um, rethink our, our list of topics and technologies, mm -hmm. as, well as, our, mm -hmm. as well as our process. So I think in the future, and especially um, as seen in the current um, app that Miriam created for us, um, you're going to start to see more visualizations, I'm hoping, more interactive components, and more ways for the community to engage with the report and the topics year-round, uh, not just receiving the report, but actually mm -hmm. participating in it perpetually. Oh, that's a great idea. Uh, yeah. Where is this new app? Oh, the app is available at go.nmc.org slash app. And it's just a really great um, experience. You're able to view videos. All the links are active and peruse oh, projects. Nice. Nice. Deep dive. So uh, what would the uh, interaction look like? I mean, we already have every year, or for every report, we have a Delphi board. So we have you know, 30 to 50 people who get to work on this. And there's that level of interaction. But how else could this be interactive? I think that um, right now, our expert panel, as you mentioned, um, is 40 to 60 international experts. Mm -hmm. But what if we expanded that? What if there was 100? Or what if anyone mm. can participate mm -hmm. and contribute mm -hmm. ideas? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just about um, even opening it up even further to more perspectives. Well, it would be wonderful to see uh, lots more people involved. It would be great if we could uh, gamify it. I would love that. That would be so much fun. Let's do what that. We call it? What we call it? Game of the future? Uh, Horizon game? Yeah, gaming the future. I love that. Okay. Nice ring to it. We just stopped the session, and I'm just gonna we're gonna do this right now. Oh, yeah, that's, let's do it. That's fantastic. <laughs> that's fantastic. Uh, just thinking about Horizon and thinking about the conference, and I need to let you go because you have a whole conference to help run. Um, I'm really glad you're here. Oh, I'm so well, happy. What are the biggest Horizon themes that you've been seen that you've seen embodied in the conference? Oh wow. Um, I I think again that. The role of um, student as an active learner, more hands-on and immersive experience. I think that's why we're seeing such a enthusiasm around or such enthusiasm around virtual reality, uh -huh. the ability to simulate uh -huh. sim, uh, simulate experiences that students may otherwise never have access to. Yeah. So it's about what technologies can enable those types of experiences, and NMC presenters have really been coming up with um, really creative opportunities and best practices. That's a great way of putting it. Thank you so much for coming, Sam. And Thank congratulations you. on a great conference. Oh. Let me just like shoo you out, go back to the people, um, and uh, thank you so much for coming. No, thank you. We're thrilled to have you, and it's such an honor. Do we have any questions that we can ask from, before you go? I'm trying to see if anybody has bugged you yet. Nothing yet. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll, we'll come after you. We'll All right. Later. Sounds and we look great. forward to playing the future. Thank you. Me too. Okay. We have more people here. We have, have to imagine that there are outside the door people who want to come in. We have uh, sessions going on. And among other people, we have Trent. Trent, I need to do it. Pronounce your last name. Hergen Raider. Oh, Hergen Raider. Hergen Raider. This sounds like a band. Yeah. This sounds like it could be a great <laughs> death metal band. Yeah. So, you know, welcome to the Hergen Raider. <laughs> It does. It does. Oh my gosh! You know, and so the next you know, return of the Hergen Raid. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so welcome. I'm Thank really you. glad you're Thank here. You. Um, we haven't met before, so it's a good way to meet on camera. Yeah. Uh, so Trent, you are doing a presentation about creating shared worlds, right. and it was both about shared worlds, the poetics of those, but also how students can participate in creating shared worlds. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, sure. The, uh, the project that I'm working on, I call collaborative world building. And the idea stems from some of the frustrations that I had teaching traditional creative writing workshops where I, I've got this slide that I'll, that I'll have in my presentations where it's people in these gigantic hamster balls, right? Where everyone creates their own world, but no one else can get inside. So then you just have these hamster balls sort of banging into each other, right? Yes. And I thought, okay, well, one of the things that happens when I'm teaching, I, I'm a genre fiction writer. So I teach science fiction, fantasy, horror, sort of uh, uh, fiction workshops. And, and what they, what you need to do in those worlds is establish some rules, right? Because you need to say if this speculative world with either a technology or magic or whatever it is, there needs to be a baseline reality that Absolutely. you're sort of working against. And I thought, okay, but everybody's subjective sense of reality, or everybody's sense of reality is very subjective. Right. If we're working in a collaborative world, people mm -hmm. need to talk about how do they experience our world before they can start collaboratively building a world with magic or technology oh, or things really like that. So yeah. what, what we do is I foreground it by saying, okay, we're going to have this world that'll either, it'll be in some popular genre, cyberpunk, steampunk, you know, high fantasy, sword and sorcery, things like Zombies. that. Zombies, right? And the first thing that we need to sort of establish are what are going to be the base rules for these worlds in which we know that, you know, can people fly or can they, right? Mm -hmm. How does magic work? But what we find, too, is that those rules are always going to be or around those rules. There's also all these social forces, right? Mm -hmm. how, does, how does the economy work? How does the government work? How do people, you know, what, are the, what does just an average person do on a daily basis? What's the gender relations like? What are mm -hmm. social, rela you know, uh, race relations? What's the level of technology? Is the military involved? How important is religion, right? We need to discuss and understand as a group, 20 students, how the world works. And what you're constantly seeing happen is students sort of talking about, well, how do we think, how important is religion in our world, right? Like, does religion keep me from doing things, you know? And it's like, well, no, but yeah, kind of, right? We've Let's got this whole the world. Yeah. all of religion. I can right. see how this goes. So, um, so that rolls on for, for, you know, a number of weeks. And then once we start to, you know, have enough structure and enough understanding of that world and the way that those rules that we all agree to play with, they build individual characters. And then in some classes, we do tabletop role-playing games where the characters then go explore that world. And at other times, I'll just grab a bunch of different people, places, and locations that people have made, and I'll mix them up, and I'll, uh -huh. and I'll give it to somebody and say, okay, here are your, two, uh, your story. You can write about whatever you want, right. but it needs to have these two items, these two locations, and these two characters, right? And what I find, too, is that it creates a completely different creative writing atmosphere mm -hmm. in which suddenly, if you write a story and you use one of my characters, I want to read that story, and I want mm -hmm. to tell you whether you got that sense of the character it's right or wrong. Right. <laughs> so that uh, was a different world. Yeah, that's, that, that was right. That was that's the world that's five minutes behind us. That makes sense. Yeah, that'd be a very uh, useless thing to have in some ways. <laughs> uh, although if you had such a world, you wouldn't have privacy anymore. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's a great Asimov story about this, but. So, so in the first sense, when students are playing with characters, they get, you can interact with them through tabletop RPG, right? Like, uh, say, Dungeons and Dragons or Gamma World, right? right yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, cool. or, or if you want to have them uh, write stories, mm -hmm. so you know, you've got your your uh, cyberpunk world. So I've got uh, the character, and I have to write it, and then you get to assess it. Yep. Now the students create these characters, and they get to assess each other's work. Yes, it's all absolutely. Pure writing. Absolutely, and that's where too. I mean, the nice part about the rules is it gives everybody something to hang on to, so you don't have. Um, you know, most role-playing games will have a system in place, so you can't have an overpowered character who can right. be the all-conquering whatever. Right. Right. You know, you need to level up in order to get mm -hmm. to that, that degree. So everyone starts off on an equal footing, whether it's sort of a system where everyone has the same number of points they get to distribute, or whether it's some sort of other random way of generating a character. Uh, and they get to experience the world through that position. So, for example, one of the classes that's an alternate history is Steampunk Rochester. And it takes place in 1920s Rochester with a steampunk mm -hmm. element added mm -hmm. to it. And the, the people who choose to be female characters, and some of, the, some of the men in the class choose to be female characters as well, mm -hmm. face very different social um, pressures than do the men in those classes. And that becomes part of their narrative and their frustration and not being able to do everything that they want to do yeah. comes out in the fiction, right? And it's like, oh, well, wouldn't it have been frustrating to have been... Uh, you know, facing those kind of, um, you know, discriminate, discrimination and things like that, um, it becomes a really, it, it becomes personalized. They get, you know, students yeah. um, become really emotionally attached to their avatars, just like people do in their role-playing games. So, so it works really well. So for a this is for a creative writing class? This is for a creative writing class, yes. So you're really just kind of defamiliarizing and reorganizing how students think about characters. Right. And this is very different from, say, autobiographical MFA fiction. Uh, how much technology do you use in this? Not a whole lot, actually. This is one of the things that people have said, you know, I'm at RIT, so it's an institute of technology, but right, we right. use a free wiki um, and Google mm -hmm. Maps, right? Mm -hmm. So very low, low barriers for, uh, for entry. And one of the things that, because there are so many game design students who come to RIT, 
I really try and foreground all of the narrative things and the experiential things. The first time that I taught at RIT, they were really into the dice pool, right? Like, you know, min-maxing and those kind of things. And, and I've learned in time that I really need, they're so familiar with the game and they're less familiar with uh, sort of the narrative aspects that now I've, I've switched to a different um, role-playing game system, the Fate system, which is much more about yeah. storytelling, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, in order to get at those core concepts about character and motivation and decision-making. You know, I run into similar problems when I'm teaching digital storytelling, where I'll have people who really obsess over uh, the minutia of iMovie or trying to right. really hyper-correct an audio level, and they forget about engaging the audience right. or how something changes over time. Right. So, and that's where, too, I mean, for... I need a faith solution. For yeah, exactly. Oh, that's, that's, that's where, you know, the students, too, they're coming from 3D digital design, they're coming from game mm -hmm. design, um, they're filmmakers. They've got a lot of different ways in which they want to express themselves as storytellers, and right. very few of them are going to go on to an MFA program. So right. that's where I'm trying to think about, okay, if we look back to, you know, the Iliad, right, you know, or even the Old Testament, right? We've got very old characters that still seem like they would make sense in a contemporary environment because human beings have been very similar in a lot of ways throughout all time. And that's where I'm trying to get at is it doesn't matter if you're going to make a 3D animation or you're going to make a, you know, a role-playing game, a video role-playing game. You need to know what a good character is and how that character has to face the obstacles that present them in the world that they're in. So we've done other exercises like taking a common character like Huckleberry Finn and say, okay, drop Huckleberry Finn in uh, Mad Max, right? How would Huckleberry Finn react? Because you need to understand, you know, who Huckleberry Finn is a character, right? Um, and you can kind of, if you get a good sense of what, a, what, what the environment is, what the forces in that world are doing, and you have a good sense of the character and what they're motivated by and the way that they view the world, you should be able to mix and match a lot of different times and come up with interesting, interesting combinations. Well, it sounds like remixing plays a key role in your pedagogy. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and really leveraging what students know. I mean, they know a lot about games. One of the first times, the first time that I taught this class, it was a post-apocalyptic class, and we played Fallout 3, so we, w we watched Mad Max, played Fallout 3, and read a bunch of stories from John Joseph Adams' collection, Wastelands, and mm. talked both about mm. Mm. the sort of what, the, the, what each individual medium does well and what, it, you know, what others do better than that. Mm. Um, and then when we started talking about Fallout, I was really amazed at, I thought everyone would do sort of the same sort of narrative that I do. You, you come out of the vault and you go do the same things, and I was amazed at how hardly two people in that room didn't do the same thing, right? They built their characters different right. ways, they went in different right. directions, and it really foregrounded all these questions about characterization that I've been trying to get using the more sort of traditional workshop methods. So I started, that's really what started making me think, there's a lot more to this, right? Tapping into things and genres that they're familiar with, they're doing really sophisticated work at a much deeper level than I was prepared for, which was a great surprise. Well, let me just walk back a couple of steps in that. I mean, one is that Fallout 3 is one part narrative game, but one part open world. Mm -hmm. So it, um, I know my whole family's played it, and, uh, and we have um, different characters and different styles. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see how when the character begins the game and escapes the tutorial level, we actually literally went in different directions. Right, and, right. Uh, and they've only been playing Fallout 4. I haven't yet. I've been very careful. Oh, that's great. I know. It's great. I know. Yeah, it's a time We live near Boston, so it'd be you know great to be able to do that. Um, but also thinking about your students as gamers, mm -hmm. you know, how how gaming has developed so rapidly and so thoroughly that their gaming literacy really is a major issue. Mm -hmm. How big are your classes? My classes are usually about 20 students. Okay. So and that's for and that's because they're writing classes. So yeah, that's really, a max for writing. Classes, yeah, to, really. to dig into to dig into the the writing that they're doing can't be much more than that. And do you find that um, your students have any particular challenges when they approach storytelling? I mean, is there a blind spot or are there issues that they really need to work on? Yeah, I think one of the things that I've noticed is that, especially early on when I first started doing this, and one, again, one of the frustrations that made me start looking for alternate models was the, the focus on plot. It was that you come up with a plot and then you're just going to drag your character, right, like a, like a marionette, you know, yeah. through whatever plot you'd come up with. Yeah. And one of these, the, the formulation that I've come up with is that you need to have a character and then the character plus the setting will produce the plot, right? If a character has a different kind of motivation, right. you'll come up with a completely different plot, right? I mean, if right. you... If it you should be. Yeah, so, and that's, that's the idea, is starting with character rather than starting with plot. Because I think the way that they uh -huh. tend to be taught uh -huh. narrative is that there's some goal there that you right. need to learn, you know, these tools for literary analysis to dig out that goal, and then you'll have the meaning about life. And I think that's a really boring way of looking at literature, right? It's, it should be more experiential. It should be more thinking about the decisions that the characters are making and you assessing what do you think about these things and so you're, it should you're, open up. You're going against the MFA tradition. Yeah, right, exactly. That's, that's my, other, my other job is blowing up uh, 
traditional creative writing. So this isn't Raymond Carver here. This yeah, is right. Very, very exactly. Different. Exactly. Well, Although you could. I mean, like, could you imagine Raymond Carver as a role playing game? You probably could, right? That would be a very dreary role playing yeah. <laughs> game. But, uh, um, but no, it sounds like I mean, your experience in genre fiction writing. So you've written in fantasy and horror. Yep. Um, well, speaking of fantasy and horror, let me ask you're presenting at this conference and mm -hmm. you've been attending sessions. How people responded to this idea of world building as pedagogy? Oh, they love it. They love it. And I think what people keep saying too is creative writing is one of the things. I just um, I'm also a, an editor on the the journal of Creative Writing Study, which is a brand new journal. We just got an article in on Common Core and how creative writing can be can achieve so many of the things in Common Core. And so this is and, for uh, K twelve. This is for K twelve, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, well, the the journal is for any any kind of creative writing whatsoever. Uh, but what we're finding uh, uh, is that creative writing is being marginalized in higher ed because it's already been dumped completely by K through 12, right? It's, there's, really? there's not enough, there's not enough reason in the common core, what people would say mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to do it, right? It's time that you, you cannot have. And the, the point of this right. article by Chris Drew is that no, you can achieve a lot of the things that common core is looking for through creative writing. Um, and that is um, one of the things that I think we need to return to is what can you do in these spaces with narrative that meet these these literacy goals, right? And it may not need to be just reading, you know, traditional print reading and writing literacy. It could be all kinds no. of literacy. Well, if we can go back, I mean, this connects nicely with what uh, Samantha was just saying, uh, that she's seeing here at the conference is push for students to go from being consumers to being producers. Right, exactly. So you know, a student writing fiction or right. nonfiction is doing something different than simply just you know, reading it. Exactly. Reading. But also goes back to were you here for the keynote? For yes. The cycle? yes. Again, the students play an active role in their in their learning. Absolutely. I, I have more questions, but I'm sure other people have more questions. So again, friends, if you uh, haven't had a chance, um, pounce on the two orange buttons if you want to come up on stage and talk with us, or send us a text or text chat to everybody else. Let's take a look at Twitter too and see what people have been saying. You have to imagine, friends, that we have a whole stack of computers all lined up doing different, different things right now. So, um, now Dan has asked me to do a death metal vocalist impressions, and I'm not going to do it again. But I, I, I may, if you want, we could talk about future trends if you like. Uh, and we have a lot of support here. Uh, Gloria Dougherty uh, is a big fan of the shift from learner as consumer to learner as maker. Mm -hmm. And again, I think, well, we can go back to Tolkien's essays on how to write fantasy, the right. co-creation idea, right. which is so vital. Right. And I just taught a class on, on Tolkien last semester, as a matter of fact, and the idea that the, uh, world, the world building is something that we looked at. Um, how it's built. We started with the Silmarillion and how the whole world. You started with the Silmarillion. Yeah, I know. I'm cruel. That's, oh, that's uh, hardcore. Well, I think oh, if you can't yeah. hack that, they can drop, right? Yeah. So they, get... <laughs> they love it though. They love it. Tolkien is a weeder class. I yeah, yeah. Like, this, this is brutal. You know, but, um, and you know, again, the Silmarillion is all. It's a kind of like nonfiction version. You know? Right. It's, right. It's, it's exactly. like a I, mean, I love it. I love it. Oh. But you know, one of the other things too, thinking about this idea of what students know, I teach these fan fiction courses as well. I've been teaching a Game of Thrones class, and what we do. Okay, I just wanted you to say that again. Okay, I teach a game. I teach two different te Game of Thrones classes, as a matter of fact. Two Games of Thrones. One, one was Game of Thrones in media, where we would read sections of the novel that corresponded to the show, and then we would look at the graphic novel, and then at the end of the semester, we played a bunch of different Game of Thrones games. How is the graphic novel? Is it any good? No, it's okay. not. Um, but uh, but still, it was really useful because again, with the students coming from their varied interests, I had filmmakers in the room. I had people who were majoring in medical illustration who could comment uh, uh, very uh. very knowledgeably, much more knowledgeably than I could on the, the style of the art. But, well, especially after the Red Wedding, you can do a yeah, right, medical exactly. illustration. Yes. But the uh, the role playing game, there's a Game of Thrones role playing game that's excellent. And the, what we started with, and I had a, I heard a couple students talking about how it wasn't anything. This class wasn't anything that they had expected on the way out. We started talking about the the different kingdoms, right? The seven different kingdoms, and how is right. Dorne different than the North, different than the Westerlands, and those things. Right. And we started, and I asked them to think about our own American mythologies and our mm -hmm. own regional mm -hmm. mythologies, mm -hmm. because we had a student from Texas and we had a student mm -hmm. from California. And what does it mean to be a California? I'm a proud Midwesterner. I'm a Wisconsinite, right? Ah. So we start thinking about oh, our and own. And you left Wisconsin. I left Wisconsin for this yeah. job, right? So we start thinking about regionalisms and what are the stories that make sense? You know, yeah, the yeah. Paul, Paul Bunyan, you know, sort of mm -hmm. like a, a Minnesota mm -hmm. Wisconsin thing, right? Mm -hmm. You know. Um, um, and thinking about how can we relate that to what that means for our own mm -hmm. sense of identity, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. what, what are the stories of Dorne and what is their sense of identity? And the ultimate thing at the end of this is that you're going to create a character. And if your character is from Dorne, your character needs to have a deep understanding of the culture of that area, right? And then are there factions within Dorne? And the role-playing game leads you through this with, with a very structured way to be able to build mm -hmm. your house. Mm -hmm. You know, is your house founded on a mad, you know, a mad ruler or a... a 
Probably. You know, chance or, yeah, something along those this lines. Sounds, this sounds like, you know, um, the tutorial level of, say, Fallout 3. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, imagine an MFA class that did this. I know. I would love it. I mean, one of the things that I find, too, trying to, when I when I contact people who are in the more traditional um, writing, you know, people who are publishing in Magazine of, magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, and things, I ask show. them, like, do you want to do, do one of these projects? Like, I could get a grant, you know, and maybe yeah. get you... And the answer is always no, right? I mean, I do, I do my own thing, and uh, I like doing uh, my own uh, thing, and I'm successful right. doing it. And I would, you know, I wouldn't want to have to play in somebody else's um, world. And it's like, okay, well, that's fine. And I'm wondering whether the whether there's a generational shift because my students don't have that problem at all. They and you're, you're right. The opening the opening weeks of these courses are the tutorial, and then they start adding to it. So they get to create their own people, places, and things in Westeros, and then they create their character last. And by the time they hit that. They are ready to go. They know more about this world. And I mean, there are people in there too who are, um, you know, saying you didn't pronounce that word, that Bravosi word correctly, right? You know, and they know slang and Dothraki. And it's like, okay, you know more about this than I do. And it's great. It's a great place to be as a, as a teacher. You know, and I have some, some colleagues who don't think it's very serious because they don't right. think, you know, Game of Thrones is high culture, you know, all these things. And I'm thinking, it's fine if you don't want to. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. I get you know this class fills within ten minutes with a wait list, sure. and then I'm people sure. are knocking on my door asking if they can somehow get yeah. in. So I'm I'm satisfied with that. Will they write fan fiction about your class? Yeah, well, maybe right. You know, right. You, you get to be a, a real life fan. The, um, I wonder about the generational difference. Um, you know, that's a theme that's come up a couple of times, um, which is that uh, here at the conference that you know we have there's a kind of traditional generational gap between. Um, I should say correlation between technology usage and age, mm -hmm. and there are exceptions. There are exceptions, and some of them are here at this conference. Um, but you know, generally speaking, the older you are in the United States, the less likely you are to use certain technology. Right. Um, and I wonder if that's not also true of pop culture. Right. You know, we're seeing. I mean, I hear from a lot of older movie critics how ah, I don't want to see a new Spider-Man movie. You know, I don't. But still, they sell. Right. Um, that gap might be pretty large. Well, hang on a second. Um, if uh, we're talking about your students creating a stage and populating with people, mm -hmm. let's take a look at the Shindig stage. And what I'd like to do is do what's called a mingle session. So the way this works is, you know, you and I are on the top of the screen okay. uh, on the stage. We're going to get kicked off uh, and get to mingle with all the people who are in, in the audience. Right. And so we get to talk with them and see what's going on. So what I'd like to ask you guys, uh, everybody who's listening to this right now, is to think about these developments of students as creators. So we've talked about this on a few different levels. Students making fiction, students making worlds, students using certain new technologies. Samantha's talking about VR, for example. And how are you seeing this in your own work? Where are you seeing students becoming empowered to do this? How are you seeing your campus or your library or museum supporting that? And what are the challenges? Well, let's take five minutes think about students as makers. Uh, talk to each other. And again, just as a procedural note, if you don't want to talk to anybody, that's perfectly fine. So what you can do is uh, you mouse over your cursor, and there's a little button, which is a lock, and you click that, and they'll basically close you so that people just can't stumble onto you. So if you don't feel like talking or if your mouth is full or whatever, do that, and people don't get to just crash into you. On the other hand, if, like me, you're outgoing and want to chat with complete strangers, Please mingle away. Uh, and if you do want to communicate but not use video, just use chat or use Twitter just so we have some record of what you're thinking. Again, students as makers, five minutes, mingle. See you in five minutes. And I think what's fun, you know, I turned 42 and like, you know, in my late 30s, I started realizing this was really important to me. And I think yes. a lot of people are having these epiphanies and we're seeing these books like, uh, I can't remember the author's name, but the book's title is Of Dice and Men. Um, and there's a lot of reflections about what role playing meant to people in their in their teens and in early years. And I think right now it's it's come out, right? Because we've got this moment yes. where games are now important and people are understanding they're culturally valuable um, and people are starting to talk and write about them. So. I'm waiting to see uh, President Obama lead a Call of Cthulhu game. Yeah, that would be, uh, I, I think also, no, or Delta Green. Be Delta Green, yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. No, these, these, this may be a long-term curve, and yeah. uh, I'm, I'm glad that you've been part of that. Um, well, we're going to unconscious of time here. Yep. We have to unleash you in the rest of the conference. Uh, Christopher, can you bring us back up on stage, and then, um, and then we can have our last and final guest. Thank you very much. Well, welcome everybody. Glad to see you again. Uh, we now have. Our third, I was going to say guest, but this is a mega guest. Um, 
I, I just want to say that in our discussion um, uh, in the mingle session, one of the things that came up that was really interesting was the long time curve of not just students as makers, but also of role playing. How we have a trend that goes back to the 50s and 60s, really. And we have several participants who mentioned working on gaming in the 90s. And again, now we have, uh, you know, Trent was discussing how it was difficult being uh, talking about gaming when he was a teenager, and now it's mainstream. These things have really changed. So speaking of changing, uh, we have a return guest and a new guest. So we have Maya, um, welcome back. And we have Emery Craig. Thank you. I'm glad you. to see you here. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. We, we planned the clothing setup in advance. This is, this is the New York contingent here, so it's all in black. And I was right. spiritually with them. Right there. A little bit of blue, a little bit of blue. Right. No, I got, I got a touch of that. All right. Yeah, a little bit here too. Uh, so, so you guys, I mean, Maya was here before talking about wearable computing. Did a wonderful job, very inspirational. But now we have something very, very important that's in a different angle. This is another emerging trend that Horizon Report has been talking about as well. You guys were doing a workshop about augmented reality and about virtual reality. What are some of the conclusions that came out of your of your session? What are some of the big takeaways that you want people at the conference to have? I think the big takeaways for us has been that we've been doing this work for about two years, and uh, our sessions have been seen as okay, some some kind of something in and out of the future. Yes. And I think um, the workshop we did on uh, this week, uh, it felt like people are really stepping out of the room and saying, "I need to bring back this back on campus." Ah, and I think it's ah. I think this shows that now from. Uh, talk about the future. This is becoming the things that I will already should be talking to my team, to yes. the yes. people um, you know that I work with. There's probably things that our students can do, yes. and it's it, it really is a cross section between people coming from the liberal arts curriculum, from from libraries, from medical schools, and other professional schools, sort of art, architecture. So it was great to see sort of that sort of moment for us. It's like, you know, we've been we've been going and talking to people, but um, to see sort of really the interaction come on the next so, level. So you have AR and VR across the curriculum. Yeah, why not? That's right. well, I agree, why not? But, but you're actually hearing that. That's yeah, right. Yes. And I, I mean, I, I think she's right, though. And initially, there was this, well, we have to talk about it. And now it's, I have to bring this back to the campus. And there are a lot of people saying, yeah. our first Oculus Rift is showing up, or we mm -hmm. just got mm -hmm. HoloLens the other week. So all of this is just starting to steamroll into a whole new direction. Um, oh. We have to do more than talk. We have to start yeah. really strategizing how we're going to make use of this. This is June, so this is traditionally academic downtime. Right. So now they have the stuff. Now, thanks to you, they have the ideas. September is coming up fast. They're going to have to start rolling this out on right. campus, in a library or in classes. Right. Right. So this could be the decisive moment. This could be 2016. could be the year that VR and AR really start to really bite, really hit the road. Yeah, we've been saying to everybody, you have to start playing. Yes. It's time to play. Yes. So I, I think that um, it's fun, and of course, people are asking, you know, this conversation about maker spaces. Um, mm -hmm. And in you know, maker spaces, there's lots of um, lots of institutions that are sort of either having one or on the way of making one. And you know, people, are, there's there's a very quick you know way to get there. You know, the cardboard is less than twenty dollars. That was my next question. Um, <laughs> and it works on the mobile, and you know, like just people, as soon as people realize or make the connection, oh, okay, so. You know, oh, it, it doesn't take much to, to set up a space for, like, uh, allowing people to experience some of the mobile VR apps. You know, even like mm -hmm. things like the New York Times and mm -hmm. some of the stories they have produced and some of the other uh, platform yeah. so apps and VR experiences that are emerging. So Google Cardboard would be a good place to start. Yes. Unless you can unless you buy a Vibe or, you know. Right. right. Oh, very good. Very good. Do the nice thing, of course, about Google Cardboard or a similar sort of portable device where you're leveraging your phones is that students can take it home with them. They can track, you know, not just doing it on campus or take it back to the dorm room. They can use it anywhere. And the cost is a wonderful cost point. It's, it's, it's much less expensive than a single textbook. <laughs> A lot expensive. It's like a front cover of a book, really. And it kind of opens up all these different worlds. And mm. the option of opening up a whole bunch mm. of different textbooks and different experiences, yes. you might call it, or different texts, living text. Uh, or hear that. This is a huge possibility that you can revision not just the spatial experience of being in a classroom, but also to reimagine what a textbook is. Yeah. I mean, a textbook through VR would be extraordinary. It would be absolutely extraordinary. 
and I just found this this uh, spring I do a course New Media and Society and my students had to have mobile units and use their phone mm -hmm. and they're adult students so they're all engaged with their communities and every single one of them brought the devices into work, into their schools, back to their families, and came back after the first week that we started working on this, though some of them had already jumped ahead and done it, came back and mm. said, oh my goodness, you wouldn't believe everybody's reaction to this. Mm. And so they, in effect, kind of became teachers themselves using this, that they were sharing this with others outside. Besides what we were doing in class, they were taking this and going outside of class and looking at what they could do with it. What kind of reactions did they get? Oh, everything. Yes, but most of the time, very, very just enthusiastic, positive. What was really interesting, because you were talking before about um, the generational differences in the mm -hmm. use of technology, mm -hmm. a couple of them actually came back in and said, it's the first time I trumped my teenage son. <laughs> this was it, okay? They had not done this. I have done it. I actually brought something home instead of me going to them and saying, Snapchat, what is it, Snapchat? Or what is yes, that? And how yes, does that yes. work? They came home and said, I kid actually said, I got to hand it to you now. <sighs> So that's kind of a, you know. Flip the generation gap on its head. Just, right, just flip it upside down. Tip of the day. Tip of the day. <laughs> no, this is great. I mean, this is, I mean, it beats LinkedIn, right? Which is, you know, they, that's like the, the major technology that adults use more than kids. But, um, right. Well, how about AR? Where should we start with augmented reality? I think that some of the ways for augmented reality, you know, folks are really interested in is really um, sort of add, seeing a project uh, which is a flat project, right? whether it's an image or text, and being able to add on to it, being able to have a video that explains the creation or the making of, of something. Okay. Um, in, in particular, I'm trying to kind of really center it or focus it on, on educational examples. So whether it's a, um, whether it's a piece of, uh, of art or a piece of uh, student work to be able to augment that and I'd you know I'd kind of have 3D view or and that 3D view, 3D view to be shareable with other folks you know people who are not immediately in the room with you uh, or um, something sort of that would tell you know additional facets of the story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. that's one way and of course there's a lot of uh, in the medical in you know in the medical sort of in engineering and a lot of the models which pe students right now sort of the ability to look at them in a in a 3D in sort of to come to life mm -hmm. not not just mm -hmm. be in a textbook and even not even on a web page i think that's where uh, ar at the moment is is gaining sort of a lot of interest what do you and think? Well, I also think that AR sort of blurs into the mixed reality area, which, and, you know, we had a kind of very interesting conversation in a workshop about that toward the end where people were like, okay, wait a minute, now these terms, where does mixed reality fit between, mm -hmm. uh, and the continuum mm -hmm. between AR on the one hand and full immersive virtual reality on the other hand? And it, and it is a little confusing because on some levels you could just say the mixed reality is kind of AR on steroids. It's just, you know, the sort mm -hmm. of hyper version. Mm -hmm of AR because you're adding more than an overlay, you're actually adding digital objects into the environment, but you're still mm -hmm. in the environment. You haven't, when you do VR, you just close yourself off to the world here mm -hmm. and you've mm -hmm. stepped into a whole new world. Mm -hmm. And that's just sort of a very fluid thing conceptually mm -hmm. that I think we're just going to have to work out over the next year. But so at the moment, some of the AR, I think you're right, there's the, the wonderful overlay and it's uh, of text, which is going to be so helpful in medical fields and and yeah. just in so many fields and, and museums, I, I think yeah. we're going to very quickly move from, you know, wearing something and, you know, and just listening to audio and just having something that, you know, that we can just have the text right there and perhaps it even points out specific things that we part or something like that. That would be fantastic just without being it. able to physically interfere with it. Yeah. So you can you know, snap yeah. on this layer which breaks down yeah. all different points you should pay attention to and then you step the layer off and then see the thing by itself. Yeah. And, and this is going to change dramatically with the um, Tango enabled phones that are just starting mm. to come mm. out. Lenovo just released one last week and that's um, there's going to be a whole bunch more coming in the future. And that adds a whole nother layer to this because Tango uh, phones can map your environment space. Uh -huh. That's crucial. That's that is crucial. very, very important.
just remember everybody who is uh, on, on this uh, event that there are plenty of opportunities for you to ask questions. So again, we want you to ask questions by uh, chat. Um, if you'd like to raise your hand and come up on stage and talk with uh, Embry, Maya, and I, that's great. If you'd like to tweet at us, that's also good. Uh, this is a ton of concepts, and uh, I just just say as an observer, I wasn't able to attend uh, your session, but I just saw an audience that was just a buzz with ideas and concepts. But where do you, where do you, so while you guys are asking questions, where do you think, I mean, is mixed reality going to subsume both of these, that AR and VR are going to be like black and white TV and silent film, and you know, that MR will be the thing that they, to consider going forward? I think VR will always be somewhat of a separate area because it will always be that fully immersive experience. Okay. I think the AR and the mixed reality will probably blend together at some point, though perhaps down the road this is sort of really future thinking, maybe there will be a point there will be headsets where you can just range from one to the other and you know, you tap it and you go, I just want overlay the information, I want to just block out the world and go totally into yeah. an immersive space. But mm. right now mm. VR mm. really separates itself out because you just step into a whole other world. Right. Well, it's so occlusive. I mean, it just, it just blots you out. It just blocks you out. So I'm thinking something like bifocals yep. right, or a monocle where you can just you know switch back and forth. Switch back. Or you saying that's transparent. Right. Lenses. Yeah. Lenses, exactly. Yeah, lenses. Right, right. A contact lens. Yeah. 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 And, and because you have to think all this stuff is going to get so much smaller. I mean, I mean we're going to look yeah. back in yeah. five years and we're going to laugh yeah. at Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive as state of the art, as innovative as these devices are, in the same way that we look back on older cell phones, right. smartphones, Car phones, and right. go, can you believe that somebody actually carried this around and went out and paid a lot of money for <laughs> this? And, you know, I thought it was. The, you know, the, the yeah. best thing ever, and it was until the next thing came along. Yeah, I think I think the virtual reality will remain. I think it it's a very powerful space, in, um, you know, to for, create, for world creation. And I think one of one of the things where I think um, about, when I think about this is, you know, it's going to get this whole field is going to get even more interesting when students can start creating their own worlds. And instead of trying to explain and you know, kind of their thinking, um, they will be able to kind of invite you over and yes. and you know, just yes. kind of like. Uh, walk you through what they have created. And I think this is the kind of like the, the moment when I, I will be super excited and uh, looking forward to it. And I think it will be kind of really a lot of energy into this as opposed to now where we are really kind of trying to figure it out and trying still like, still, you know, looking out even even the, the language yes. of AR, the yes. language yes. of AR. Yes. Um, so. Much less the grammar of it. Yes, yes. I'll have to say, um, Back in uh, when I was in 1997, I was teaching a wonderful class uh, called the Gothic and the Virtual, uh, which is just an insane class, and uh, <laughs> they have wonderful, wonderful syllabus. And a couple of students uh, wanted to make a final project of a VR level, so they used a game. Uh, it may have been the Quake Engine at that time, and they built an elaborate meditation on Dracula and uh, and cyberspace. And I had to actually go to a lab with them and put on this kludge together duct tape device, right? And you know, walk through it, and they had to explain parts of it to me because it wasn't completely perfect. And I thought, this is awesome, and I didn't see anybody else do that for the next ten years. It just just fell off. I mean, VR was way ahead of its time, uh, but now, now students making worlds that should be the assignment. We need to go back and trend. So, do we have more questions and comments from people? So, from Jeffrey, we have a good question, which is a synthetic question. He asks us, what was the standout session or the standout moment at the conference? So, obviously, I would say your pre-conference session. But besides that, besides that, <laughs> Thank you. What, would, what would you think? What, what moment or what session really stood out for you? I mean, there's just so many good ideas so many. and so many good conversations. And I think oftentimes... Um, I think the NMC is just as, you know, to be at an NMC is just as, as ex exciting being inside a session as well as just being um, around the tables and the hallway. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very hard, but I think that, you know, I think that people are interested uh, in experimentation. People are starting to kind of be a little bit more bold in um looking and seeking sort of new ideas and i think that 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 is that's really you know it's exciting to me i think it's strange to see that 
we're not just um, going with um, you know a online or course development or some mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. some kind of integration of technology. But people are trying to see this as a bigger picture. You know, just mm -hmm. um, as most there's more synergies between. Um, experiential learning, between storytelling, be between digital tools. So I think this is maybe why there's kind of like these three teams and, you know, obviously emerging, emerging technologies being virtual reality, being sort of interactive video and digital mm -hmm. storytelling, mm -hmm. the sessions you led and I think they were just so much fun. Um, so I think that's, that's probably some of the key teams I see. And you, just like, like what you did yesterday in terms of the scenarios and sort of just sort of mm -hmm. future thinking about higher education. And that's just, it, it's wonderful to see that sort of, um, to do a, a workshop where there's tremendous fluidity in what happened. And I know you walked into that and you have a certain plan, but you also don't know where it's going to go. Because okay. it really depends on the audience itself and where the audience takes it. And the strength here of NMC is the people that come and, and mm -hmm. was the, the people yeah. who were so engaged in, yeah. in our session and that were engaged in your session. And you know, some of the real highlights are in your conversation when you're coming, you know, we were coming in the door, the conversations you have in the hallway or that you overhear in the hallway between people talking about. You know, just what they saw and what they start thinking about, what, what you know, what provoked them to to start to wrestle with these ideas. Uh, I, I wish you'd been in my uh, my automation storytelling session because uh, all I got was pushback. Really, people were engaged. <laughs> they were excited, but they were excited in a hostile way. No, no, no. They, they were all. Fun. I don't believe that. But it was it was really interesting, and and for me personally, as a researcher in this field, it was it was fascinating and very useful to hear all these different arguments. Right. And then I had fun, you know, extolling the superiority of silicon over humans. But um, but it was it was um, it was these were great conversations and ones which I wouldn't have had you know, obviously by myself. Yeah. Um, but also a really engaged crowd and a very intelligent and, as you said before, my experimental crowd, willing to you know, look ahead. We have an, another question that came up, uh, and this is, from, uh, this is from Dan Blickensdurfer, who wants to know, how is the Internet of Things being implemented in higher education? You know, what's coming with that? Now, this is a great question. Do you guys want to take a, a step at this? This is different from VR and AR, but it's related in many ways. Yeah, it's different. I, I think we're just on the cusp of this. It's it's hard to talk about because I think we're not quite there yet, um, but I think it's definitely coming, and we're going to end up with students bringing in a wide range of devices uh, with mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be just bring your own device. It's going to bring your own everything, yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> you know, and then it's just going to... Yeah. Um, well, I think that one way is, I think that it, um, educational institutions be looking at this uh, will be everything, you know, what happens when everything, when we wear things that can talk to other things, when whatever I'm wearing, my device can talk to the walls and to the classrooms and to other devices as I, you know, uh, as I make my way on campus as I engage with things and I think mm -hmm. everything from you know what you touch and, and doing the cafeteria to what you do in class in the classroom and I think all this is kind of feeds into the whole internet of things various analytics from learning analytics to just engagement analytics and all other things and you know with games and other things coming this is going to be just some a huge sort of ecology of, mm. of, I think, mm. data mm. and data points. And I think Internet of Things will be there, you know, from things where you like to park your car um, to, other, to um, you know, how your day went when you parked it in some place and, and not another, and, you know, you move into, how you move through the campus. Well, let's, let's, let's think about health. Um, I mean, yeah. if the device can monitor your health, and so it can talk to you about your body, mm -hmm. which is an interesting experience today. Right. But then also to have uh, that information sent to somewhere else. So, for example, to have a caregiver have that information. So, as you said, a beautiful phrase, when we wear things that talk to other things. So, you know, uh, if, if my son has this issue with his health and then I'm, his devices learn about this, they communicate to my devices, so I read about this on a flexible wear of my clothing, suddenly that's a very, very different ecosystem. Um, and I, I love this, this sense of bring your own devices, which we're still not at yet, to bring around everything. I mean, this is we we'll have a kind of carapace of, of digital technology. Uh, our campus is ready for this. It's a huge, huge issue. And are we okay. ready for it? That's going mm -hmm. to be a huge issue because, mm -hmm. I, you know, yes. again, you get into the generational technology issue mm -hmm. of 
older people doing the um, I'm private first and then I'm public second. Uh, Whereas you uh, get a very younger generation growing up going, yes. no, I'm public by default. And then I yes. pull back and make private what yes. I want, yes. want to make private later on. And I think we're going to kind of have a conflict with that because That's we're going to be right. sitting here as educators going, no, we have to keep some things private because we feel we need to because of regulations or because yeah. that is yeah. just our, our you know, the world that we come from yeah. and a generation yeah. going, no, it's not an issue to me. Oh, right. I'm going to share my glucose levels. Right. right. Well, right. Glucose right. levels, that's fine. Well, my heart beat is. <laughs> oh, are you saying last November I was blogging from a hospital bed? Right? Yeah, right. I mean, that, were. that would be insane from the 1950s, for example, you right? right? You know, or the 1990s. <laughs> you have to go back 10 years, even in this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever we call yeah. that first decade of the 21st century. Right. Yeah. Uh, we have, um, there's, you have identified so many different possibilities. This is really, really exciting. And the problem is we're on time. Uh, it's just we're a minute away from three o'clock, uh, and we have to stop. I, I was, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You just thank gave you. us this glimpse of the far future, which is going to be September. September, right? yes. Yeah. Because you're describing how all these things will happen. So I, I encourage everyone to, to watch carefully this and, and to experiment. Now, we have one more question um, or a, a comment, uh, which comes from Chris Lott in Twitter. And I just want to put it out there. We won't have time to address it, but I want to think about this. So we may have to have a session on it. Uh, Chris asks, what do we think about digital citizenship in this new world? Which is a, so let's come back to that. That's a political, ethical, personal, social question, and that has a lot going for it. I just want to um, uh, say that, first of all, thank you guys for coming. Thanks to Trent and Samantha. Uh, I want everyone who's listening that next week we have another different session. Next week we have no guest at all besides me. But what we're going to do is a reprise of what we did in March, which is where I'm going to walk you through current trends in technology and education as of this bleeding edge moment in June 2016. So we're going to talk about a wide range of things that have been informed by this conference and research. And along the way, you get to interact and have questions, comments, and so on. So please come by this you know, seven days from now. Next Thursday, 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we'd be glad to see you. Uh, let me thank all the guests. Let me thank the NMC for letting us crash in and yeah, hold this right. there. Uh, <laughs> let me thank uh, the Shindig team for all their support. Shindig and is great. We, uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.